Ah. I was just thinking, I can't be the only one here. Wait, is there something wrong? How are Hi. You? Well, it's very nice to see you. Very good to see you too. Nice background today. Thank you. I was just going to change it up, but if you like stellar it, stellar background today. It is stellar. It is stellar. Stellar. So, how are you doing? <clears throat> Pretty good. A few too many balls in the air. Not mm -hmm. enough of them paying. Um, but uh, but trying to sort out how to make all these things, you know, fly. I hear there's developments along the way here. A little rumors popping up here and there. Uh, uh, yeah, and we've got like the channels in the Mattermost that anybody can go look at. Hey, George. Hey. Uh, hey, hey, Ray. Hey, Doug. Um, yeah. So, so it's all, it's a little bit like a star nursery where, you know, different elements are, are coalescing out of the primordial goo in some sense. So it's Hence fun. the background. Hence the background. Mm -hmm. Although my favorite background is the scene from Soul. Yes, I like I that love, too. I just love that background. That one is second to uh, the, the, the control room from Inside Out. You know, uh, last week I was, uh, I was trying to get in there because I had, had this great joke on that subject. And you didn't call on me. Oh, shoot. Gonna, if you called on me, what I would have said is, hey, I'm only here for Julio, Julian and some of the other backdrops. I don't know, nice. It's not as funny now as I thought it was then. But... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was one of those things of the moment. In fact, I've been living in, in this whole world of audio versus video. We'll, we'll wait for more people to come on. I got some phenomenal news. Absolutely. Oh, cool. Unbelievable stuff going on. Awesome. Yeah. That's great. That's great. I'll share it with a wider group because I have a request. <laughs> Excellent. Mike, how's newly married life? Still going to use wearing a ring. That's the biggest change. <laughs> <laughs> and then updating records. Okay, you're, so your wife's and not wife ring. rather than partner. <laughs> That's right. That's I right. got married when I when I got married. I got my ring, and I found I couldn't do coin magic anymore. Oh, and I had to. I had to get rid of the. I with my wife's permission. I had. I kept taking it on and off and on and off and on and off. It was going crazy, but I walk. I literally walk around with a coin in my hand. You I could just file a, file a groove into the I coins some, or something. I, I actually can right type over. with. I can palm coins in my hands and type just fine. So, but That's my right. wife really was. Why, George? Well, George, why aren't you wearing your ring? So, I don't know if surgeons have to do that, or I'm sure there are. But violinists don't like to, and magicians don't like to wear rings. And any good sailor doesn't wear any jewelry or anything yeah, on their hands because that's what that's what will catch and tear your finger off. Yep, that's right. It has right. happened to many. Yeah, I once borrowed a ring. I made it disappear, and it, and then I handed it back. To, it was the biggest diamond ring I ever saw in my life. I mean, it was this was a, and I handed it back and I went on and did some more magic. And she was an elderly lady and she tapped me on the shoulder. She said. Um, Excuse me, Sonny, but um, may I have my ring back? And I went pale and I started sweating. And she says, gotcha. <laughs> um, awesome. She really, I almost had a heart attack. Because it's well, got to be, be a $3 million ring um, or more. You probably gave her a cardiac too in the, during the trick. So she was just getting even. Why the, I never accepted a ring like that any ever again. And all my professional friends said, you idiot, you never accept a ring with a stone in it. Because it, what well, if the stone drops out and, you know, but anyway. <laughs> but it's magic. You could just or it was make... costume jewelry and she was going to sue right you. <laughs> at least it wasn't a cigar ring like we did. Like, like when I lost my virginity, right? <laughs> I didn't know about that custom. <laughs> <laughs> I think cigars had gone out of style. <laughs> <laughs> that's right you know i haven't seen anybody smoking a pipe in like 30, 20 years yes my dad used to smoke a pipe i used to smoke a pipe my, yeah smoke a pipe too. maybe i have him for 40 friend of mine who smoked a pipe died of lung cancer and about six months later i thought gee you know you haven't smoked a pipe oh not since he died i didn't consciously give it up i didn't think about it it just stopped mm -hmm. weird 
Weird survival strategy. That's how norms are made. Oh, our yeah, subconsciouses exactly. are working, looking out for us. Exactly. Um, so a couple words about our check-in calls and we're, and so far we're not that many here, which is great. Oh, and I'm realizing I totally, totally spaced on sending a note to the list last night saying that there's a check-in call today. Uh, I have a few, th few too many things in my head. Um, well, you've done a natural experiment and I think you got your results. Which is my normal, yeah, exactly. Uh, which is my normal habit to send a reminder call. Uh, and if anybody would send a note to the list saying, hey, join us in this call, I would appreciate it. Anybody who's got a second? Um, I'll do that. Thank you uh, very much. And um, and we're, we're busy thinking about you know, how to, uh, uh, ironically, we're not that many right now on the call, but what to do about the Thursday calls if they keep growing, because uh, we call them check-in calls and we don't make it around to everybody to check in. Uh, and I don't want anybody to walk away feeling like that. That didn't work. So, so my, my best description of these calls so far uh, is dip and mix or dip and stir. And what I mean is I treat, this is just the way I treat our Thursday check-in calls. I, I treat it as dipping the ladle into the river, the clear flowing river of what's happening in large community among our people who are headed toward the sea on a particular sort of mission where we're not all exactly on the same mission, but we're kind of fellow travelers. And I'm, I'm dipping the ladle in to get a sense of what's happening at the time. And then when something interesting shows up in the ladle, I actually like put it in the pot and, and, and mix and stir because often when I do that, um, interesting things pop out of everybody else. Or you, you don't know who knows what about what or makes a great suggestion. And sometimes our individual projects are lit up and aided by the mixing. And also that way we get to know who's in the room and what they care about and how mm -hmm. they're thinking about the thing they're doing and all of that. Uh, so, so it's kind of like dip and dip and stir is kind of my, my approach to the calls. Um, and we're considering like, should there be other calls with other rhythms? Yes. Uh, should we have other check-in calls that other people host? Probably yes. Um, well, I don't know that we've hit that scale, but I, I, you know, nobody'd be offended if that happened. Um, and we're trying to create sort of a distributed way of doing this OGME thing. I have a um, lot of suggestions for you that we can. If you wanted to lead off with some suggestions and then check in, George, that would be well, a we, phenomenal I, thing. I'd like to I'd like to check in first and let you give a context for the suggestions. Okay. Uh, and somebody's noise is next to the mic. I don't know who. Uh, go ahead. So the joke will work now. I'm only here for Doug and Julian's backgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> Julian's got a new background uh, every week, apparently, and he's traveling the world. Who could who could miss the check-in call? And this is a new background for Doug. Um, so uh, sorry, Judith. Same old background for you, huh? It's <laughs> <laughs> is that real or is it a background? That's real. Oh, okay. well, it's a real, it's a real, it's a real photo. That's why it doesn't it's, change, right? <laughs> it's a real photo, but it's not behind you at the moment, right? No, it's actually my bookcase downstairs at a different work area. Oh, okay. That's what I was doing. Exactly. So it's a blend of reality and not reality. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's my bookcase, but it's not where I'm sitting right now. Mm -hmm. All right. So this crazy thing happened to me this week. I was on, on the, we're going back and forth with one of the heavy hitters on um, Twitter spaces. Um, and uh, which is the new audio uh, version of Twitter. Um, they're hoping it's gonna overtake Clubhouse, um, which is a cesspool um, at the moment. And, and um, to use the milder language. And uh, he dragged out of me, much to my surprise, this story has a crucial uh, reason for my telling it. He dragged out the, something I hadn't realized. He, was at, he, he said, well, let's get together to talk, uh, but I prefer audio only, not a Zoom meeting. And I said, how come? And he said, well, the, he started playing back to me stuff I've been preaching for 30 or 40 years. Uh, and I said, wow, I've got some experience with that. He said, what's your experience? He dragged out of me that I am probably much to my surprise at the time, um, the world's most experienced audio group conference moderator, facilitator. 
What? Uh, I, yes, I, I, I invented the telephone focus group. Oh, and I've right. done close to 10,000 audio only group discussions of all kinds, focus groups, seminars, quest Q&A sessions, 15 different forms. Uh, I've trained hundreds of moderators. And so he dragged this out of me. You know, I never thought of it. I never did the mathematics, you know, about eight or nine focus groups a week um, for 30 years, not counting client meetings and debriefings and all kinds of other things. So anyway, he said, well, you know, you're so experienced. Why don't you come on to a, we'll set up a spaces. I didn't have the rights to use spaces yet. So he said, I'll set up a spaces and we'll invite people to learn moderating from George. I said, okay, I don't know how much is in my head. It could be 15 minutes long, could be. So anyway, it's like riding a bicycle. All this stuff popped out of my head. Um, I, we, it was originally supposed to be an hour. I kept apologizing for going over a little bit. They kept asking me question after question after question. Finally, we said, look, we're overstaying our welcome. This is going on long, turning into a marathon. Those of you who leave, please leave uh, with our thanks for participating. But uh, I said, I'll answer questions as long as you want. So anyway, it went three hours. Um, they then admitted me into spaces after all of them went back to the spaces people, said, hey, you gotta leave, let George on and listen to what the hell he has to say. So I threw a maiden voyage birthday, I mean, a maiden voyage celebration a few days ago, about three days ago when I got led on, I got led on to spaces on April Fool's Day appropriately. And um, I, so I, we ran another one that ran to three hours. Um, and now it's causing a gigantic stir. The people at, at Spaces and at Clubhouse are after me to transfer my expertise. So what I'm gonna, what I'm decided to do, I, I mean, I can't give away, I've got, my first telephone conference call was in 1971. It was an epiphany. I was studying for- I'm Willing to bet the phone had a cord on it. Yes, oh yeah. It was barely above a tin can with a string. There was an operator there too, wasn't there? Hmm? Yeah. There was an operator there too, wasn't there? <laughs> yes. Josie, get fact, me. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's not just a joke. Uh, you couldn't set up a conference call without an operator. You called the conference call operator. She set up the conference call for you. She didn't know how to say hello to people. She didn't know how to welcome them. She didn't know anything. And despite all that, it's a, it's a long story. I did a lot of destructive testing. But I see I was going for a PhD in psychology and, and my specialty was group dynamics. So when I heard my first conference call, I said, holy shit, this is unbelievable. Nobody knew. Nobody knew what a conference call was. People who had been on a conference call, they had all fallen. And okay, I'm getting to the story. I'm sorry. Let me, let me, let me stop. Uh, so anyway, my expertise is finally getting recognized. I know that I could make either spaces or clubhouse or whichever one wants to take my technologies and make them the winner because the quality of the discussions over Facebook and, oh, oh, sorry, over spaces and Facebook and Instagram, all of them are developing audio services, everyone. Um, and they're not gonna be able to survive without audio services. So the, the uh, audio only conference, this has some implications for Jerry, we need to do some experiments. Audio only conferences are better than video conferences and I can prove it. I know nobody believes me who hears that the first time. Not a single person ever believed me when I say it, but then when I demonstrate it, like we could turn off our video right now, have a discussion, turn it back on, continue the discussion, turn it back off, et cetera, et cetera, A, B, A, B, A, B. And what you'd universally say is I enjoyed the video much, much, much more because I like seeing the faces and the backgrounds and all that stuff. But the, this, the quality of the discussion absolutely was better audio only. No distractions, no, 
No, so well, I ran I ran a podcast for nine years. Some of some of the people in this room were on it. It was called the Yi Tan uh, Tech Weekly Call, Weekly Tech Call. Yi Tan is Mandarin for conversations about change. I speak no Mandarin, so that was it was a little odd. And it was pure <laughs> audio. We used freeconferencecall.com. Um, we had yes. a side we had a side chat on IRC, which was very geeky. So the half of the community that came in from the financial world, because this was kind of a hybrid of me and Pip Coburn, our communities, and I was usually most the host. had never been on a conference call, probably, right? Um, by the time I started the ten calls, mm -hmm. they'd, they'd, everybody had been on a conference call. Everybody so was, was playing with conference calling. Um, I loved it. It was great. I deprecated it before podcasts got cool again because uh, I was trying to stream it off, you know, to the podcast systems. Right. And, and I find these calls richer and, and I find these calls no less stimulating conversationally. So I'm interested. Yeah, this is a in special your, group of people. And technology. also the, you can't beat video and face to face for the social aspects, the chat aspects and all that stuff. But for pure content, if we're trying to solve a problem. We're trying to make a decision. We have an output we want. Audio is incredibly better than video. Well, then I, then I prefer shared document and audio only because just seeing everybody's a little bit distracting. And, and, yes. and working over a shared document that you can coll co collectively edit is super powerful and is better than, well, I'm not so sure about this. Because sometimes well, being in like peer programming, being in the same room and yeah. staring over someone's shoulder yeah, is I, also very powerful. I very strongly powerful. agree that a, a shared visual focus is, is very helpful, yeah, um, especially helpful. once you go over four people. As soon as you get to six people, at least one person goes quiet. Yeah, a whiteboard is phenomenal. A whiteboard, yeah. particularly a whiteboard, like if you're even, doing a creative idea on, generation one time. session. You just, even having a chat stream. Um, Ray, can you hold on until George is done? wondering? You can pull the person back, or they can ask questions without interrupting the flow. Uh, as I'm about to ask, can we just speak one at a time, please? Uh, uh, I'll just finish the sentence. That, so, that I is, think a chat maybe, stream and a whiteboard or a Google Doc is a very good visual focus. Uh, thanks, Ray. That's go one ahead. of the myths. You, if you don't mind, Jerry. Uh, uh, go ahead, George, and then Doug. Uh, asking people to speak one at a time is. A, is a great way to shut down a discussion. I don't mean it critically. I don't mean it nastily. I'm trying to, I'm offering it helpfully that every time I would train a moderator, the moderator would say, let's just speak one at a time. And I would say, no, speak whenever you want. And our social graces are up to sorting it out. If two or three of us start, start to talk at the same time, I wish that was true, George. So there I go speaking over you. And the thing is that um, there are some people who are less likely to stop when two are speaking at once. And if you leave that going all the way through, then you'll get four strong voices and a lot of people. But in my, in my conference system, I had a little button that could immediately mute the whole thing. Ah, you had the God Everybody button. but me. So if I needed to break in, I could do it, but they couldn't. I mean, there are ways, there are control mechanisms. There are ways around it, and it's not as bad as people think it is. And what that was very white male to me. <laughs> I mean, North Ken, American, North American white male. Yeah, see, Ken and I and Ray well demonstrated, Ray, well demonstrated. And, you know, and and it, it, it really works. Uh, but uh, Ray's right that they somebody goes silent, and the person, the silent person in the room. I don't say this publicly, but I'll say it to you guys. Uh, the the quietest person in the group is invariably either the smartest or the dumbest. And you better find out damn fast because you may have the world's leading expert in something who's just holding back to see what other people are going to say. And they don't want to dominate the discussion and they're being courteous. Ray was about to, Ray's got his mouth open. So Maybe it's a good time for a round to hear from everyone briefly. Um, right. which, is, which is our process on these calls, Ray. Um, I wanted to ask Doug had raised his hand, which is the protocol we typically use in these calls for the floor for the next person to speak in sequence, which is just our general protocol here, which usually works pretty hummingly. Uh, and, uh, and, and George, I'll come back to it, but I'm extremely mindful of the quiet people on the call and often in groups, I will ask all the people who have spoken to step back and not speak for the next half hour or whatever it is, right. make room yeah, for the voices yes. that haven't spoken. Yes. Also, I love having a chat channel because very often there's people who just are not verbal and they, they don't like speaking in front of a group, but they're perfectly happy to contribute a whole bunch on the chat. So the more 
kinds of media you can provide for the conversation. Often it makes for voices that didn't have a chance to And that's the way to do it rather than call on people. Because you call on people, you embarrass them and you force them to talk and they may have nothing to say. And Sometimes. that's a very gentle way of doing it, the way you, yeah. you know, step forward if you want, just out of courtesy, want to hold back for a second, see if there's anybody else trying to get in here, you know, that kind of thing. Cool. Uh, but and, we, and I think we all have our facilitation. I mean, experienced facilitators have their bag of techniques and protocols and whatever. And I appreciate sort of uh, the experimentation and, and going free for all here would work, but I'm afraid that there's a part of my job is to try to make sure that there isn't someone that overtakes most of our conversation here. So we do hear from a, a bunch of people. Um, and with that, let me switch to- try some on off experiments with video though. Yeah, oh, let me sorry. switch to Doug for a second uh, so you can jump in. Okay, uh, one of the things that's important about the visuals, if you're having a serious conversation is seeing people's faces begin to move as though they want to speak. And knowing that is very important and you can't do it in an audio. That's um, not true. You, you hear them clearing their throat prior to speaking. But you don't know who it is, George. Yes, I do, because I have oh. audio indicator lights that tell me who it was that cleared their throat. Oh, well, so you have God panel. So, <laughs> so you had a God panel that let you mute selectively and know who was clearing their throat, which is unusual. Y yes, but okay. they're building but it in. Clearing now. their throat is not what most people do if they're getting ready to be in a conversation. It comes at the very last moment before they speak. And I'm busy watching for that. And when, 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 for me, when Zoom chats get bigger than I can see in one glance, when we get two screens worth, mm -hmm. I then lose my ability to sort of watch the crowd and see who's leaning in and who's, who's like wrinkling their, even furrowing their brow because it's like, ah, that's not working for me. And that to me is a cue that I might want to ping, I might want to ping that person and say, all right, all right, what's, the, what's with the furrowed brow, Mike? Well, I was going to say that that's exactly how Skype and Zoom help. They indicate who's lost, who's got a question, or if somebody's really nodding vigorously but not speaking up, that's going to be really helpful to keep a, a vibrant debate going. If you want to debate, and 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 as a speaker, seeing somebody who looks confused really helps you remember. Okay, I I might have to dig into that a little deeper. So but I, I do a lot of non-audio, non-video calls just because with a team I know well, there's a rapport and there's a focus. Exactly. Yeah, but that's with a team I know well. I mean, it's- Exactly. So I'm gonna um, take moderate prerogative and say, A, thank you actually. We, we've never done any reflection on the OGM call about moderating and process and technology. We have, we've done very little talking about that. We just kind of go in and do that. So I, I appreciate that round. Uh, I do want to head us back into the normal check-in round. Uh, Eric was here only briefly, so I'd love to go to Eric and then Kevin and then Vincent. Hey, everyone. Nice to see your faces. <laughs> I felt like connecting. Um, I had, um, yeah, the, the, my weeks have been really challenging, uh, as I said before, but it's, seem, it's seeming to get better. I'm getting more focus and perspective and I'm, I'm working on what do I want? Do I want to engage in a social space <laughs> or do I want to work on my own research? Because I notice if I go into these kind of spaces like uh, Kiko Lab, OGM is more like everyone checks in and it's kind of okay, but still it can be intense on my brain. Um, and, and whenever I, if, exchanges with people who do similar things like the co-coaching it's like it's full on for me um i need i, I notice i need a lot of time to digest uh what i'm working on and um when i do that i notice that what i've written before and the research that i've done until now it does make sense and for me it's like how do i deal with this like i i'd like some people to listen to me and really take time and sometimes a bit socially awkward it depends sometimes I'm really socially spot on I don't know it might the quality of my discourse certainly if it's uh, textual textual email and stuff is not always the best but sometimes I can but I, like the the whole scope of what I'm doing is so big it's so complex it's so layered 
that starting a conversation about it, it takes at least an hour or something before you're on a level that it actually really makes sense. And um, I'm trying to package it in, into a format like a white paper or but still, it's like it's all these worlds that come together. It's it's like trying to summarize um, Jerry's brain. <laughs> That's like you can summarize what it kind of is as a concept, but you can't con summarize the contents of it. Um, so I'm constantly in that process and uh, trying to figure out. Like I, <laughs> it's been taking me weeks to buy a new phone that allows me to go to a clubhouse, but I, I'm holding it back as well because in this kind of space, it's, it's also full on, I imagine, and it's constantly high speed, very much reactive, reacting to each other. That's how I imagine it to be. I don't know how much deep listening space there is or how much digestion of what's really going on. They have I've a lot of features now that help, help with yeah. that, and they have a 15% club of people who are sight impaired and um, mm. blind and uh, they're really really helpful and supportive with it you really ought to get a hold of them okay so, yeah i'll try it then so i hope i can buy an iphone soon <laughs> but then, um but uh yeah thanks and but you have a good there is a good quality of discussion if you look for it on yes. clubhouse yes. Um, it, it's sort of like the web, like once everybody discovered the intertubes and the web, a whole bunch of just crap showed up, but the good stuff didn't go away. It was just buried by a lot of crap. The um, floats to the top. And well, it depends where the top is, right? Because when all you've got is like Google search or whatever, if you don't know how to find your way to the good conversation, and if the good conversation is protecting itself in some way to, to remain a good conversation, um, then it may you may not you may not locate it. So mm -hmm. so it's easy to then make a mass judgment that this is all chaff, it's all crap, and and there's nothing good here. Um, Eric, I don't know if you were on the phone when I was describing when you were if you were on this call when I was describing the the sort of dip and mix approach I have to these calls. But you may want to take that approach to to di digesting the world, because I I can really empathize with your situation in that I feel like I'm trying to digest the world and putting it in my brain, and my act of putting in my, in my brain a little piece at a time really works for me. And it's just a little bite at a time. And, oh, this is an interesting article. Where does it go? How does it fit? What else does it affect? What can I connect it to? And that's because of those are the gestures of using the brain. But if you were to just take a little piece out and, and maybe it's little blog posts or, or whatever, but try to describe this one paint stroke at a time that might actually help you. And I think Judy has some advice as well. Go ahead, Judy, you're muted. Apologies, I'm muted because the phone was ringing in the background. Thank you. Um, I have an alternate approach, or at least it's my, my mode. And that is that I make notes of thought clusters, you know, just a topic. Mm -hmm. and, and then I, because I need reflective time. My process of digesting is the reflection and the contemplation, if you will. And so I make notes of topics. And then I come back to that list and pick one randomly. <laughs> or whichever is speaking to me and, and just sit and reflect on it and, and develop my thoughts around that. And that works for me. It's a, it's, a, it's a very different approach than the one that Jerry's describing, which is why I just thought I'd mention it. Do you, you use it, paper talk, talk, or electronics for your notes, Judy? Like where are you? Where is actually, your... I'm doing them on paper because I, I'm just not, I kind of, I'm a little old school that way. It's a carryover from when I used to do active journaling, which I don't do so much anymore. Um, but it's just a, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of notations of stream of consciousness in terms of the mm -hmm. desire to dive deeper on a topic. But I know that if I dive deeper, I won't listen to the rest of the conversation. Mm -hmm. I'll check out for like four minutes because I'm thinking about it. And by the time I might, in this format, want to say something, the conversations move to a whole different point. Yeah, mm. yeah. And Thank so, you. so that's just a different way. But from the times we've yeah. interacted, Eric, I think we may be somewhat similar in how we respond and process. Yeah, I, I, I actually, when I do that, when I just have a piece of paper in front of me and I put topics that, like anchor points of what's going on, then it helps me to structure and to make like to to have a meaningful conversation as well. Otherwise it's just react reaction mm -hmm. on reaction. I've had this a lot also in workshops and and, and, and social change spaces. So yeah. 
Agreed. Thank you, Eric. Um, Mike and Julian have their hands up. So, Mike. And you're muted. Good. Not anymore. Um, I had a couple interesting experiences this week that I wanted to share and also get some input from this group. Um, we, we had a session Tuesday night with the key people at one of the top international relations think tanks in China. And it was a discussion on trade, military operations and technology. And I had just a few minutes to kind of share a sense of what's going on on tech policy and why the US and China are getting more and more competitive and even confrontational. Part of this is just Trump taking hostages and causing President Xi problems, and trying to show he's a tough guy. But there's also a, a breakdown in communication. And one of the problems is the Chinese talk about the technology front and standards of wars. And whenever they start really getting serious, they quote from the art of war. That doesn't make Americans comfortable. It doesn't help those of us who want to find some room for common ground and cooperation on important projects from <laughs> environmental technology to climate change. I mean, frankly, the, the, the language is getting in the way. And, and the, I'm also having a problem with the project we're doing with Korea, where we've commissioned three papers on how to, um, how to um, improve the information infrastructure of Korea. And the fact there is that the papers that are collaborators have submitted are pretty waffly. I mean, they don't take stands. So my question for the group is whether I can follow up with any of you who have had a lot of experience talking to the Chinese and might be able to give me a quick lesson on, on how, to, how to communicate <laughs> more effectively. Or maybe there's a book. There, there is one book I found on China called Dreaming in Chinese by Deb Fallows. Who's a Jim Fallow's uh, wife, yeah, and a great linguist, and she analyzes in ten different chapters ten different Chinese words and yeah. gives you a sense of why their words mean different things to our, us. But my my real problem is just this cultural divide is causing real problems. I'm writing a paper on this clash of words and memes, and and having a few linguistic insights would be helpful. So a friend of mine in Belgium named Pascal Coppens uh, specializes in China, has written some books on China, lives, uh, lived in Beijing for 20 years. I think he's back in Belgium now, uh, I think, uh, but is really good on this topic and uh, might be able to give you some good advice. So I'll send an email intro uh, separately, Mike. Anybody Coppens else? Spelled C-U-P-P. Uh, see, I typed him in the Mattermost chat, C-O-P-P-E-N-S. Pascal, P-A-S-C-A-L, Coppens, C-O-P-P-E-N-S. Thank you. Um, anybody else with tips on uh, Mike? If you email, I me see that. Can, yeah, I'll, I'll go to you too, uh, Mike. I've yeah, Mike. I, I have a colleague in Malaysia, Andrew Sheng, who's okay. doing a lot of writing uh, on Chinese American relations. I'll send you his email on the chat. I appreciate Ken, that. Ken, do you want to finish what you're saying? Yeah, Mike, if you email me, I put my uh, email in the chat here. Um, I have a friend who's done a lot of work. He's from Taiwan. He's done a lot of work in China. Um, he's the person who helped uh, get the World Cafe book translated into Chinese, and he was very insistent that it not be done in simplified characters. I didn't know what that meant, and I discovered when I went to Taiwan that when Mao came to power after he killed all the intellectuals, he removed the full character set and only taught a very simplified character set, which meant people couldn't actually express themselves with a lot of nuance. Mm -hmm. And there's still a simplified character set over there in China, so uh, wow. that was one important thing. The other thing that pops into my head is that, you know, in China, I'm not a Chinese expert, but I do know the concept of saving face. And yeah. given the way that the U.S. treated China in the last four years, it seems to me the U.S. needs to make some kind of overture to allow them to save face. You know, so that, that, that's mm -hmm. got to be a large mood component of what's going on here. That's just from my very, you know, lay perspective over here. Yeah. One of the key things coming out of the meeting was a very strong push from one of the Chinese side to say, you've got to do a Biden Xi meeting. There has to be sort of a, you know, we are together on this, whether it's climate change or something else. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they pointed to the Obama Xi 
meeting that was held in 2013 outside of Palm Springs as you know a major milestone. It was it was you know she's almost it made it sound like it was a coronation. You know that <laughs> the, the big American had said you are a worthy partner. Yeah, yeah, it's a big gesture. Uh, we should symbolically send over our table tennis team. <laughs> I mean, just uh, uh, lambs part, to the slaughter. Part, part, partly, partly in jest, but partly as a reset of diplomacy with China. I mean, seriously, it would be a really interesting gesture to engage the U.S. table tennis team, about which I know nothing, um, and, and bring them into a meeting. Uh, so, a brief side story that just for inspiration, um, I heard the story of how the Rainforest Action Network uh, figured out how to connect with Mitsubishi, which was busy harvesting uh, palm forests in Borneo. And their first couple of meetings were really contentious. They were really kind of, no, nobody was getting anywhere. And at the third meeting, when they showed up, um, the head of the Rainforest Action Network, they exchanged uh, business cards uh, ceremonially again at the start of the meeting. And he flipped his card over and he had his card translated into, into Japanese. So everything on the back of his card was suited for the chairman of Mitsubishi. And the chairman of Mitsubishi handed his card over on recycled paper. And he had traveled to Borneo between the two meetings and had seen what was happening on the ground. And he then later resigned from Mitsubishi and joined Rainforest Action Network and good things happened. Orangutans are still in trouble. But the, but the little symbolic gesture of the exchange of cards was momentous in their understanding that they had each stepped forward toward each other. Right? And there's, there's millions of negotiating stories like that. Um, and each of us probably has some from our own lives and all that. But, but I think that sometimes, sometimes small symbolic gestures like the table tennis team brought back because ping pong diplomacy was what cracked open China under Nixon, right? So, so refer back to that and say, we'd like to push the big red reset button and like clear the decks from what this Trump dude did for a while and forget the wolf warrior approach because it's not working with us. Yep. Right. If, if anybody's seen the movie Wolf Warrior and understands Wolf Warrior diplomacy, that's the, that is the, the mood that China is in right now. They're attacking, every, they're tackling everything in the world as if they are at war with it and that they're going to win. They're like superhero warriors. Anyway, um, and that's just from my amateur seat. I think Pascal can tell you a lot more stuff than all. Can I make one real quick suggestion? Please go ahead, George. A, a, a meta suggestion. Forgive me if it's if, if you've done this before. It, it seems obvious, but wasn't to me. Uh, a meta discussion with your colleagues about the cultural differences. We tend to do this. I notice your culture seems to do this. How do we work around that? How do we use that to our advantage? I'm a New York interrupter. When I do that, just say that to me. Say New York, and I'll shut up. You know, things like that. And I noticed that you are reticent to disagree. You never disagree. So there's, there is Mitsuki. Uh, Mitsubishi. It, no, I'm just using. Oh, you're thinking about something else. I've okay. made up a word and name. Random names. There, there's gotcha. her, there is she doing, doing her, her polite bit. And you can, you know, tell a Korean airline story about how the co-pilot was being courteous to the pilot and they all died, you know, <clears> stuff like that. Um, and just an open discussion. And the funniest one I ever had was us with the British. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all, all English speakers, obviously. That's a matter of debate. Yeah. What happened yeah. with the British? Was it about <laughs> was it about rubbers? <laughs> right. Uh, I think uh, it's misunderstandings over language. Yeah. Uh, rubbers versus condoms. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and there's, there's plenty of sort of things like that between us. Uh, let's uh, go along. Our... Well, the, the dial deodorant um, uh, octopus was horrified the people in Japan because the octopus used dial deodorant under his arm, except in Japan, the octopus has eight legs. Think about Ooh. that. <laughs> <laughs> Wildest cross-cultural cultural story I ever heard. Not arms, interesting. <laughs> um, Mr. Jones, and then uh, Vincent, and then uh, Michael. Well, I have to say I enjoyed almost none of the arguments by facilitators about how to do things. I almost left. So that's just my, my take on it. Uh, battling experts make me leave. Um, but that's, that's, again, just my take. Uh, I've been working on this friends and family funding for uh, black and brown entrepreneurs who don't have a rich uncle. 
and I reported last week we completed our crowdfunding and then we have some uh, foundation money teed up and uh, we, we got asked by the county to uh, become part of their budget this week. Uh, and it was kind of a big deal because they have these little showcase funds, the one bunkum fund, which is our county, uh, you know, uh, where they show some things as a one-time thing. But no, they said uh, connect with their economic development folks. And so we're going to, uh, in our metric at this point will be how many sole proprietors and mom and pops become job creators and how many jobs and what's the growth in revenue and what's the growth in income and then some kind of stab at net profit. And then oddly enough, just like an hour after the county said, you know, yeah, just, just you know, talk, talk to the economic development guy, not the little showcase guy, which is, you know, it means you're, you're part of the annual budget in a, in a way. And they love the fact that it's an evergreen fund so they don't have to keep funding it. Uh, they can expand it, but they, they, we won't come back to them for money. Um, I got an email from a guy in the UK uh, from our SOCAP world. And he, runs the largest family foundation there. And he's close to a guy at number 10. And uh, we're gonna be sort of uh, adapting this methodology uh, for, in a thing to, uh, that they might wanna adapt, um, especially in the north of the country in, in their rust belt uh, with a Phoenix fund. But it's, it's a, nobody's quite done this mechanism of uh, equity with revenue share for micro businesses who are not ready for debt. So anyway, it could be pretty interesting and be, you know, zooming with Boris and his folks uh, as this thing works forward. So it's kind of cool, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a little catalytic thing that, that uh, unblocks, uh, you know, uh, a thing that is blocked that they didn't know how to do with, but it was really pretty odd that, uh, you know, uh, an hour after the county said, make it part of the real budget. They said, you know, uh, can you can you present to Downing Street? Like, that is awesome. That is yeah, awesome. I know. It's, it's kind of cool. I was, I was pretty glad about it. Um, having Kevin here talking about this reminds me that uh, over on Mattermost, and I'm looking at the Mattermost calls channel right now as our, as our chat here, as our persistent chat, um, that Kevin had posted uh, an article that was important to him in the food and agriculture channel. And then Pete said, no, let's, let's start a different channel for you. And then uh, like, because there's nobody in the new channel on the new topic, nobody shows up and hears and responds to Kevin. So trying to figure out, and I think Kevin, it's the neighborhood economics channel. Is that the right one? You're muted. And, and, and okay, sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, it is not that uh, Pete set it up. It's called, uh, um, and because the economic neighborhood economic ones, ones I thought was well, I thought was for you. Yeah, nobody showed up there either. But this is this is like economic justice and racial parity, which uh, I'm not even on because I'm in the wrong one. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Um, if somebody will find that and post a chat uh, a link to that in the calls channel, I would appreciate it. And partly all to sure say, to do that. Uh, I, Kevin, don't worry about it. One of us who knows will will do it. Um, and partly to say that. A lot of us are bringing really interesting and important things to the group, but our infrastructure isn't doing us the favor of making it easy to find those things and to get attention and all that. And we're busy negotiating, like should the food and agriculture insecurity channel just only be about food and, 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 and agriculture, or should it also be about climate change and broader topics? If so, what are the umbrellas and how do these things sort of fit into each other so that we can all participate well? So. Um, separate from this call, ideas are welcome. Uh, we have a sort of a facilitators channel on uh, on Mattermost as well for anybody who wants to offer suggestions or just send me an email uh, because then we avoid the channels mess. But we're busy trying to figure out how to fit our infrastructure to our our actions and our rhythms and our technologies. And then also, if you've posted something interesting, Michael, thank you very much. Uh, Economic justice and racial parity is the name of the channel. Um, and also, if, um, if you've posted something that's actually really like important to you, dear to your heart and important to what you're trying to get done, mention it here, like show up on Thursdays and say, hey, there's this really important thing, I could use some attention, who would like to join this conversation, please come join me. And that will help us figure out where to go and how to join you. So I just joined your channel and uh, we're on our way. Any other thoughts on sort of uh, that part? If not, we will go back to uh, Vincent, Mark, I'm not, then I'm Michael. Not finding those channels, Jerry, where are they? In so right, so right now our chat is in the calls channel on Mattermost, and then Mike and Michael just posted the last post on that channel, 
is the new channel that Pete created for Kevin, uh, which ends in Economic justice and racial parity. Does that, do you see that? Yeah, sorry. Sorry, um, Jerry, maybe just to jump in here. Please. In Mattermost, there are public channels and there are private channels, right? And there are direct messages. You see that on your sideboard, yep. sideboard mm -hmm. right? Um, if you hit the more button at the very bottom of the public channels, you will see a list of all of the public channels that are available to you. Uh, and then you, you can join from there. I've actually gotten there before, but I didn't realize exactly what it was. So thank yep. you. It's just the more, it's the more button. And I think, you know, I think Jerry, what we have to do also, you know, is start to, we're, we're starting to create pattern language. So a channel that has the bracket OGM in front of it are sort of these, you know, general OGM, you know, kind of spaces. Then we have, we're starting to say, use the bracket quest, meaning this is something where we want to be using that channel, not for, just discussions, but for actually moving work forward against against a specific quest, and it should have it in the description what the quest is and and um, what we want to do with it and so forth. So I think I think as we get better at um, building channels, you know, labeling channels, helping people understand those channels, and even rationalizing, and I think I think. Um, channel divesting channels is probably going to be one of the most important tasks um, that we do. Oh, totally agree. And Matt, it brings a huge smile on my face for you to be doing tech support on Mattermost in this call. It's like, yes. Um, and so thank you very much for that. Uh, and I had a second thought, but it's vanished from my head. So let's go back to the queue, which was Vincent Mark Michael. Hi, everyone. Been a uh on too, too many screens lately, doing a lot of computer work. So I'm happy to get outside when it's nice out. Um, been uh, making some really great progress on Catalyst and did a kind of demo uh, at the last Kiko Lab call on Monday um, and hoping to kind of be able to start onboarding people onto the platform. Uh, within the next few weeks, the main kind of three components and features that I've been focusing on, which is it's actually uh, been nice to be able to focus and not have to do everything and um, is basically a member project and call directory that makes it very easy for people to update their profile project or event um, and be able to and just kind of see what's going on at a, at a very high picture level inside their communities and also be able to see what's going on between different communities that are connected. Um, so that's like the very kind of basic of it. Um, so yeah, excited to share that more maybe next week. Um, also, I'm planning um, kind of a gather town event on April 17th. Right now we're calling it the Changemakers Consortium. Just uh, um, wanted to kind of get a bunch of people together to have a focused conversation around projects and kind of networking around how to help each other on projects. So if anyone wants to um, sign up to kind of like do a one to five minute pitch on your, your project um, and be able to kind of have an audience to uh, people who either want to work on things or, um, or are sharing their own projects, um, the link I'll post in the chat, it's um, lu.ma luma slash uh, the CC um, for the Change Makers Consortium. Um, and it's gonna be at, um, we picked a time so that it could work for anyone in California that wants to be up at six in the morning and anyone in Australia that wants to stay up till midnight. So we picked uh, 8 a.m. to noon uh, Eastern on a saturday that's 5 a.m on the so Pacific. yes you have to be a really Whoa. early bird in california okay. sorry right. <laughs> but if you want to come for the second half we're kind of going to be doing uh like pitches networking and then two hours later the same thing sounds great sounds great thank you vincent that's great and you look like you were on your phone so i was like you're not going to be able to post your link but th that's perfect um because now we know where to go Matt, did you want to jump in? Go ahead. I just wanted to ask Vincent just a catalyst directory question. You know, as I'm going through the sign up process, it has it has find an option underneath why you would, you know, why you would sign up. And what if the answer is 
any and all and you don't know? That's a great question. <laughs> um, so I think that was just a kind of initial indicator for me to get a handle on like people signing up. Are they uh, people who have communities that want a platform to use for their communities or are they people who are in communities that want their communities to use this and that also want to just like find out what's going on? Like kind of just to get a feeling of like who's going to right. um, the site, right? And I actually think I'm, I'm gonna be getting rid of that, that question um, I don't like changing forms unless I completely redo it because then it kind of messes with the results. <laughs> like you have like, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. the forms from halfway on having like this different question set. So, um, but actually I've been completely rebuilding the site from scratch. So it's going to be on a different link. And something that I, I would like to propose to the group is, um, unfortunately, I found out there's another company that uh, got the trademark for Catalyst. So I'm in a kind of midst of rebranding and I'm, I'm wondering what folks think about the name Trove. Um, and the, the URL would be trove.social. How do you spell Trove? U-R-O-V-E. Because I'm, because I'm in a April, treasure trove. <laughs> April and I are both advisors to a little company called T-R-O-V, I think, dot com. Uh, which is in the microinsurance business. So the, that's really close, but, uh, but I like Trove. It's with an E, yes. As in a treasure trove? Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. You could also try load, L-O-D-E, like the mother load. You've hit the mother load. <laughs> <laughs> thing... I like Trove. I think it's a really nice, solid name from a branding perspective. It sits well on the tongue everyone can you know pronounce it and it's a single syllable so i think it's a good name i also think it has multiple complexions and i like that about it uh there's already a couple trov companies out there not just the one that i mentioned um so the, the namespace might be a little crowded and that's just without the e and trove.com is is a power company i just typed into my browser yep um, um, but you may be able to do trove dot something else, trove dot social, trove dot network. Uh, who knows what low uh, high level domain uh, would be really descriptive for what you're trying to do, Vincent. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, I was just going to say I, I've done a lot of um, work in the naming space and would be glad to to talk to you about that. One thing that strikes me about trove for what you're doing is does it seem um, a little bit too static and and not you know like things end up in a trove it's not a it's not generally an active place um but i really like it it's a really great name it just the thing it sounds like it describes doesn't sound like what i think you're doing um but I'd love to talk to you more about it which is lovely advice yeah i appreciate that thanks cool um let's go to mark michael judy Monsieur Thibault. Oui, bonjour. Bonjour. Um, I, um, I took on a new client lately, um, not so long ago, who is trying to tackle the um, um, injuries. So it's, it's in, in, in the health, healthcare space um, and trying to tackle the number of injuries happening during transportation. And every time that I take a new client, I learn a bunch of stuff. And it's all about ineff inefficiencies, of course, fixing inefficiencies. And, and so you, you have about 35 million registered admissions to hospitals in the United States uh, and 140 million opportunities for incident injury uh, during patient transport. Which uh, and he sent me a bunch of videos, uh, um, and and these injuries are not just patient related; they're also nurse related. So this he has created a, this group of doctors have created a um, a technology to reduce that, um, which which is always fun because working for and with indigenous people really doesn't pay. Mm -hmm. And I'm making a, 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 when I jumped in, I'm sorry, I was late, um, lots of work lately. 
but it seems that you guys were talking about interculturality. A bit. A bit. A bit. Um, and it's, it's, it's something that I apply a lot um, in, in this indigenous context. Um, the best approach so far has been around healthcare, again. Um, where you have, you, and, it, and it's always towards a group. It's never two groups, interculturality, right? It's one group meeting another one. Um, so when one group is meeting another one, you get to listen first. That's why I always say, you know, listening is the most uh, undervalued human skill. Um, and what happens is um, the Western medicine or medical team, some approach comes and meet the indigenous person with a traditional medicinal man or woman, and they decide together what is the best uh, path to cure or solve one person's health problems. Um, but it's ultimately that person, that indigenous person who decides which is very complex in itself because, of course, you know, they, depending of um, the, the the level of uh, acculturation and understanding of Western medicine, can be very complex. Can take a very long time. If you transport that into a different situation, it can take easily two to three years. So, in the diplomatic world, I can understand that it can be a a big problem when um, solutions are needed right away. But but it's a, I, I always enjoyed applying that. Yeah, thank you. With this and public. Um, two short things. One is that um, working with indigenous people, I think pays really well, just not in a currency like recognized on earth. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, which is unfortunate, but, but it, it, you know, yeah, there's, there's oh. like, a, Lots of words, I guess. And then years ago at an event in Berlin, I met a guy who, an American expat who lived in Berlin, whose expertise was cross-cultural communications online. And his sweet spot at the time was US companies that had Indian development staffs and all of the cross-cultural misunderstandings that would happen uh, in that particular pairing. But, but I was like, you have job security forever, dude. Because um, because the, the kinds of cross cultural communication that are happening and the, the the thinness the relative thinness of the medium and the opportunities for misunderstanding are so gigantic so it's a really it's a really really interesting space mm -hmm. love the space um, let's go Michael Judy Matt and then Ray and you are muted yeah sorry I have to get back it's just a matter mostly with with Eric. <laughs> oh, good. At air. Um, uh, one, one, uh, one little tidbit I wanted to throw in about the from the, the cross cultural misunderstanding thing was the introduction in Latin America of the Chevy Nova. I knew you were going there. Okay, just want to make sure everyone knew about it because it's just the best. Which what does what does Nova mean in Spanish? Well, doesn't go. <laughs> no, Nova doesn't doesn't run. Yeah, so here we're selling you the Chevy that doesn't run. Yeah, it was the, the quintessential bad product naming in, yeah. in new country problem. Yeah. So the other thing you have to check into, Vincent, is what trove means in, in other languages. I don't, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> um, always important. Um, I, um, I was, I, I've been uh, spending a lot of time, and I'm, I'm trying to remember if I mentioned this in, in this meeting last week, but um, uh, being frustrated around um, the, the entities we have at our disposal. I know I've talked to Jerry a little bit about, um, you know, corporations, for-profits, non-profits, steward ownership, co-ops, uh, all, the, all the different things that a company could be um, because having a company that was started as a C Corp in the process of becoming a, a, a B Corp, um, that's, you know, it could be worse, but it's, it, it doesn't feel reflective of, of who and what we're trying to do. So um, talking to a lot of people and anybody who'd be interested in, in talking about that in this, in this group, I would love to, to talk to. Um, I see you pointing, Matt, and yep. I'm, I'm thrilled to, to talk to you. 
to the back um, same, I'm in the same. I'm on the same journey. Okay. All right. And, th and there's a piece of due diligence uh, the stewards of OGM need to do, which is some kind of OGME mapping of the alternative business frameworks for as we move forward into some better millennium. We hope. Um, what are the alternatives, and what are the trade-offs, and what you know, what are some good paths to choose uh, into that? Because we we need better platforms for our work together. Platforms that are more mindful of of the commons that we share. Uh, of the intangibles that Mark is busy helping, uh, et cetera. And the other thing I wanted to, to bring up along that score is aside from the, the actual legalities, a seed I want to plant that um, came out of another conversation I was having at, at, uh, with some Mozilla folk um, is, you know, when you think of the structures of all organizational structures, be they nonprofits or whatever, they're sort of, you know, a legal entity that by nature is going to be a pyramid. You know, there, there's there's somebody in charge, some entity in charge, whether it's an individual or not, um, and it's really hard to collaborate with like-minded organizations. I mean, you know, just just with all the good spirit behind it, I know what you guys are going through with, you know, memoranda of understanding with, with Lionsburg and, you know, what are we and how does it work? Um, and the mechanics of just a circle of people who are doing related things as opposed to a triangle being brought together and, you know, and as managing to assemble the right people. I, I know how to do that. You know, I, I feel like I can, I can say, oh, this person seems like somebody who'd want to be part of this and this person, but then how do you structure, especially in a nascent entity or a changing entity, you know, you've got to come up with stock option agreements and, and you know, some, or, or pay somebody some, you know, deserved high fee for their time per hour. Um, instead of figuring out some reciprocal way to be in a circle together and do each other good. Um, it, it's just, a, it's such a frustration about the way that commercial world is structured. And there's lots of models that sort of have followed this out to the extreme. So there's uh, one entrepreneur who I can find uh, in my brain, but he decided to pay everybody $70,000. The secretary makes 70, everybody gets $70,000 a year salary, uh, which, which took people who were struggling to, like he didn't realize there were people that he was employing of his only 100, 150 employees or something like a small company. He didn't realize that people in his own company were struggling with making the rent and getting food and, and whatever else. And so going to 70,000 immediately resolved those, those well, I'm, I'm overgeneralizing, but really put a fix that and then created other social tensions and uh, you know, other kinds of things. A completely different model is Sen, uh, Senco in Brazil, uh, Ricardo Semler, if anybody's read any of his stuff, he, there's some beautiful interviews on YouTube about Ricardo Semler. Uh, and he's written a couple of books that are really good, but in Semco, all of their books were transparent and the staff set everybody's salaries and bonuses so that everybody knew what everybody else was making, which is a radical form of transparency, but they also knew all of the levers of the business. So they knew not to drain the business of profits to invest in the future. So, so complete transparency allowed them to create sort of fair balancing of what was happening. And that there's a, the Semco was a deep trust-based uh, enterprise and uh, is really interesting for those kind of things. And those are two really different models. And there's a bunch of other models that are perking up uh, as we, you know, as we live and breathe right here. So it's a, it's a really interesting moment for figuring out what these new platforms are and which ones one might choose that feel fair and equitable for the group of people showing up to do some body of work together, right? And if and if it's also a loose community that has just people flowing in and out, how do you preserve the community while having a platform that lets people sort of make a living on it as well. That's that's the the, the a piece of what we're facing right now. Vincent and then uh, uh, sorry Ken and then Vincent because Ken had his hand up uh, quite a bit earlier. Um, yeah, Michael, you're relatively new to the calls, or at least I haven't been on calls with you very often before. And I looked at Factor, and I'm just really interested. Could you just say a little bit about Factor? Because the first time I'd seen it, and it looked really interesting to me. And I hope you. People won't mind you taking a little time to let us know what you're doing. Thank you for that, Ken. 
Um, you know, this is something I should be better at than I am, but uh, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I, I would encourage people to, to take a look at the, at the landing page just because it, it gives you a, a fair idea. Um, it's, it's straddling a lot of areas, but it is um, an attempt to give people a place to gather, organize, and share the things that matter to them in the word I always use, which is an unfamiliar and uncomfortable word, word is an accretive way. You know, we live in a, this, this always on world, you know, this FOMO world where all this stuff is happening and we got to be there and you're, you're inundated by it and yet trying to escape from it. Um, and when you think of the other extreme of a library, things have to be published to even make it there. So that's a selection process and then they're organized and you can find them. And we're trying to create a way for people to see something that matters, gather it consciously, put it together. It can be something that you do alone. You know, it's certainly a single player mode activity as well as doing a small group as well as eventually be able to share with the public. Um, and skeletally, it's most similar to Pinterest, I would say, and you can have a private board and you know, nobody else sees it or work on some project with somebody, or you can look for other people uh, with interest to come to yours. Um, the other thing it is from a, from a consumer point of view and an ethics point of view is it's member supported on a freemium model or a Dropbox where if you use it a lot and you feel good about it, paying for it to get extra features, you can, but you can use it for free and there's no advertising. And because of all of that, there's nothing in our, in no way is it in our interest for you to spend a lot of time on the platform. We don't benefit from that. We're not trying to distract you. We just want you to do what you came to do and get out. And you might spend hours on it, you might spend um, that's, that's a little bit of a meandering, uh, elevator pitch, but that's, that's what the blue factor is. Based on that, I wonder if there's maybe something that we in OGM could do on factor to just help us get our, dip our toes in the water, see what it's like, and maybe it would benefit both communities. And there's a, there's a conversation Michael and I have barely cracked the door on, which is, what might he do with Factor that would turn it into a piece of the mapping platform that we're talking about here? Uh, so I think that there's a there's an experiment there to be done, and having having a bunch of people in OGM who are familiar with Factor and using it, sort of power using it for for uh, keeping this kind of information would be really really cool. Would work. Thank and you, I'm Michael. wondering, and, and Michael, I, I don't know if you've ever talked with um, Vincent. Uh, but he's using no-code tools like Airtable to build out Catalyst and all that. That's that's not that far from from kind of your use use models for Factor. Although Factor, I think, doesn't have the power not no-code kind of front end of creating all these filters and and whatever else. But but there's some interesting, I think, uh, hybrid marriage there that's possible as well. Go ahead. Sorry. Sure. I was just going to say, uh, you know, Peter had 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 pointed me at Vincent and I. Just connected with him, and uh, I, I hope to talk to you soon, fellow fellow Brooklynite. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Uh, oh, awesome! You're local. Cool. Yeah, I, I just sent you a message on LinkedIn, by the way. Cool. See, we're making all the connections. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's go to Judy, Matt, Ray. Oh, actually, could I um, jump in real quick? I had my hand raised to respond oh, to the. I apologize. Um, yes, you did. So, um, yeah, one thing, I, it's funny, Jerry, I was also thinking about that um, example. I was going to pose the question to the group. How would you feel if you were like the founder of a startup and like, you know, you're this like amazing board of advisor came in and they said you had to have, you know, a $60,000 salary and you had to have the same pay as everyone else in the company that joined from this point until like a hundred people, like, how would you feel about that? That's actually something I, I wanted to kind of get feedback on, um, on, on what people think about that. Uh, and I don't remember what 
happen to equity distributions in that company. So it could be that, you know, salary is equal, which is fine because cash flow and that's what you're paying like rent they're, or mortgage from. They're uh, booming. But, they, they're booming. They were in the news a month ago and, and they have really, really done well. Well, part of what happened was their productivity shot through the roof. I mean, it's, it's all this conversation. Uh, it's Can somebody find the name of the company? His name is Dave something. Uh, I can try to find it in my brain. I've got a bunch of links around it, um, but they but they did really well. So productivity skyrocketed. Their their revenues per employee tripled or something like that over over a couple of years, uh, et cetera. But but part of this might be that they got a whole bunch of press from having done this this HR kind of thing, right? So so how much of this is the 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 stock the Barbara Streisand effect or or whatever else? Um, but it's super interesting. Um, go ahead, Matt. I mean, from a just personal experience basis, I mean, when we started Collective Next, we paid ourselves less than our employees. I mean, that was that was the risk, right? That was the way that it started, right? Um, and I think these economic relationships that you have with various people in your system can take a lot of different forms. Um, and I think the real you know, the real question is how do we have um, multiple mental models and um, the dexterity to apply them based on um, differentiated needs and experiences, right? I have some employees that need a tremendous amount of stability. I need some employees that need lots of flexibility. I have some um, people who were employees who um, need more flexibility than employment. So they move to a kind of a network contractor relationship model. I have some contractors that are on a base amount of retainer plus additional money if the volume goes up. So I think, I think, I think the problem we have is we kind of get ourselves locked in single mental model views of how relationships work. But you know, I dated one girl where our relationship was very different than the one that I now have with my wife, thank God. But, you know, you, you, you are always in these, you know, dyna dynamic situations. So Vincent, to answer the question, um, I think if it works for the community, then I would be totally fine with it. Um, you know, if the ultimate goal is to propagate the valuable ideas that you're pursuing, um, then you're, you kind of take a different approach than if the ultimate goal is to monetize your, you know, efforts, um, then you can take a very different strategy. And I think that's part of the debate that's going on right now is, are we building durable value creating businesses, or are we trying to hoodwink ourselves into, you know, payouts? Um, and so maybe that last comment was a little bit too too bold, but that's that would be my answer. Works for me. Um, so let's go to Judy, Matt, and Ray for check-ins. Yeah, I've just been um, continuing with practicing principles and observing ways that are effective to outreach to other groups that are not connected to the groups that I'm in. Um, and mostly it's it's a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two. -on -two. You know, I'd like to know more about your organization. Can we get together and chat about it as a way to sort of engage people with different perspectives so that we can have a more rich conversation and learn from one another? That's great. And uh, it's really interesting because uh, Klaus, who is not on today's call, connected several of us to a bunch of chemical engineers uh, f uh, who were really gung-ho on how to solve for climate change. And I was thinking, I was thinking that like somehow connecting them with you, uh, because I think you would all sort of come from a similar point of view in different ways. And uh, that got me thinking heavily about how, because their, the presentation I watched, the, so their solutions were, what if you put engineers in charge of the world and it was all engineering and very little about social engineering or, mm -hmm. you know, which is, which is a, just a, a euphemism kind of, but, well, but you know, yeah. very, very little about how to make this work in society, whom to link arms with, you know, uh, creative partnerships, other sorts of things, but the science in it was just rocking. It was just like, mm -hmm. dang. Uh, so I think 
figuring out some of those blends and combos. Uh, I, I'm really interested in, in how to get movements to move, to catch and, and to catch fire and to link arms and then to fuel one another so that we, we can actually catalyze large scale change through small scale, uh, small scale changes and, and connections. And that, how do we get good at that is one of my, one of my goals here, actually. One of the thoughts that I have on that <clears throat> because of my engagement with um, large professional networks is that large professional networks are a natural way to do that because every member is a member of multiple other networks. And so they're frequently focused on the big topics that are affecting society, you know, sustainability, climate change, agriculture, you know, all those sub-disciplines, at least in the science professionals, but there's a lot of people there with social responsibility goals and they're used to working in industrial institutions and academic institutions and so on. So I, I just think that personal connections through professional networks is a powerful way to reach organizations at a different level. So just to, to draw out what you're saying, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but not only, so, so we're coming out of a world where people got a career and stayed with a company for as long as they could and retired out. That's, a, that's just changing like crazy, but not only that, but each person is now facing their own complexification as they start to figure out purpose, social mission, like how, how, do, I, how do I make what I do in the world actually like help the world, which is pretty simple. It's a simple question. It's a really hard question to answer for a lot of people. Uh, and, and in so doing, we've made our worlds more complex because we're now members of several different circles, groups, organizations. We might be doing contract work with you know, multiple orgs at the same time and it gets very messy. And, and we're, uh, there may, be, may not be a stretch to say we're the first generations to be going through that particular set of changes. Um, well, the first ones that are really enabled with technology to do it. Yeah. It's vastly easier. <clears throat> but most of these professional organizations are 100 plus years old and have been doing global networking by whatever the best method was at the time. Exactly. For many centuries. And so I think they also have that global connectedness, you know, friends that you met at the conference in China who live in China and others who you met there who are from the UK and from Germany and from Africa. And I think it's those personal networks that are going to end up being quite important in identifying organizational networks. Uh, to, to stretch this out a little bit, but to add a historic analogy, it feels to me like we're at the opposite end of something that happened long ago with the beginnings of civilization. There's a really nice book, Against the Grain by James Scott. I love this book, I highly recommend it. I'll put a link to it in the chat in a second. And he talks about how we tend to think that civilization happens when we domesticate, agri we domesticate grains and we get agriculture. It turns out there's 4,000 years between the domestication of grains and the first cities. Uruk, Ur, all of that. And he studies Mesopotamia and the Marsh Arabs. And it turns out that when people got civilized and put in cities, if you look at their skeletal remains, they had diet deficiencies like crazy. Their skeletons were not very happy because they had suddenly been constricted in their diet to eating the major grains and not very many other things while the Marsh Arabs were out on the land moving because they understood when the fish were running here, where to get this, where, and they had a hugely varied diet. So they were really quite healthy and doing just fine. Uh, and then in, over in China, maybe around, around the same sort of eras, they referred to people as cooked or uncooked. And the cooked people were the people they had brought into cities and civilized. And so, it, it, so the whole book is kind of this, this skeptical look at what civilization means and what it brought to us, uh, that it wasn't necessarily this huge gift that, that organized us and made everything prosper, but rather, uh, destroyed a whole bunch of ways of understanding how to live with nature and the things that, that I, I think we're in some sense we're trying to reclaim now. So, so it's weird because now we're sort of heading away from the mono crop, mono career, mono a mono thing into this much more uh, mixy world that's confusing to us. And, and except now we have power tools for, for sharing, communicating, you know, now you can get on a, on a Zoom call or a, or a clubhouse call with people around the world, no problem. I mean, the marginal cost to you is zero. Anyway, um, let's go Matt, Ray, Doug. Uh, Matt, you're muted. Alas. 
alas. Um, real quick, I just wanted to write down that uh, in that chat, what does it mean to live in uh, in a mixy world? I, I kind of like this idea of a mixy world, right? Mm -hmm. um, and navigating the mixy world. Um, so I've got a lot of things in, going on right now, lots and lots of things. So um, I think my world is mixy. Um, I just um, sold, and Gary, this connects to maybe something you're talking about. I just sold an engagement with um, a large organization where we are taking every single one of their 17,000 employees through small group, 10 to you know 15 people conversations, 75 minute conversations. So um, in two months, so that's 13, 1300 facilitated dialogues in, in in two months um, related to um, thinking about how do, how do we become, how does that organization become more inclusive? Um, it sort of brings to, brings to this, you know, the, the conversation that, um, you know, Judith and I sponsored last Tuesday with just a few people and we're gonna be continuing about OGM and, and, you know, what does it mean for us to be open you know, really open. And, you know, one of my reflections as I'm thinking about this call and I'm thinking about who we are, and again, I look around the room at, at you know, it's a nice smaller group today, but it's still, you know, it's clear to me that we are not open. Um, we might have openness in our hearts, but even the very structure of this call um, the way that it operates, um, who we are as individuals, the way that we talk um, creates a certain type of um, sets of barriers. And so I'm, I'm really interested in, I'm just really interested in holding open that space um, for us to, for us to investigate. Um, and, um, and at, at the end of the day, what I've been learning is that all of these changes, all the changes that I want to make within the clients that I'm working with and help them make um, ultimately start with me um, and my willingness to, to sort of be open to rethinking and reimagining and redoing. And so um, that's kind of what I've been working on. Um, the other thing that's just been on my mind. I've been talking to Gary, who I know some of you guys know, um, and um, we're looking to engage him. And maybe it's Vincent, it's you, and you know, Michael, it's you as well, and Pete. But I'm interested in trying trying out within my small ecosystem of collective next building, you know, building kind of a you know this um, these knowledge webs and collaborative knowledge web development, which is a little, you know, it's OGME, it kind of fits in what we're doing and stuff. There's some of the tools for connectors and all that stuff. But um, if people are interested in, and, and from an economic standpoint, what we're, what we're trying to do is, and I'm also talking to Jordan at Lionsburg, is that I may make a donation to Lionsburg. We may create a from that donation, we may create a, a donor advice fund within the Lionsburg construct where Collective Next may pay for some time. Um, the foundation may pay for some of the time. And then the people who are working on the projects may contribute some of their time. So this idea of multi-funding sources for singular pursuits that then move all the knowledge from those pursuits into the commons is starting to get to this dexterity of kind of really trying to think creatively about economic relationships um, so we can we can break the hierarchies of them. So that's that's what I'm thinking about. Thank you for that. That's great. Um, Doug, then Julian. Okay, um, I've been really puzzling about climate change and where people like in this group actually are with it. Uh, for example, I find myself thinking that given who we are as human beings, facing the fact that there's a nexus of contracts that link everybody together, we can't break that and the glue is carrying us towards catastrophe climate-wise. And we're stuck, we just can't, we're not smart enough uh, our smartness is not organized in a way that lets us break through our relationships and contracts with each other. 
So, um, you know, I think we have the possibility of breaking apart the society that we're in and reforming another one, but the resistance is so huge. And the people, if we try and break apart the egg that we have, uh, people are gonna look for uh, pieces of it that they can manipulate in the old way, ownership, control, and so on. So it seems to me that we're stuck and that there's poetry in that uh, to be faced. Uh, maybe it's just the way it is and we should learn to uh, uh, appreciate the world that we're in given the fact that it's going in a bad direction and we can't do anything about it. Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, um, thank you. And a piece of it is Klaus, you know, of, of, of all of us, Klaus seems to me to be tilting directly into the food system. And he's very explicitly dealing with the system because he knows that the distribution systems, which are kind of locked in and loaded around the world, are a huge piece of the problem of trying to make any sort of change down at farming, all the way up at people eating food and all, all of that. And there's people trying to tackle the system at many different levels with uh, little success. And it seems like the glue that binds these systems together, whether that's contracts or whether that's economics and wealth, which then controls politics or whether it's something else, it seems that that glue is stronger than crisis until the crisis is overwhelming. And when the crisis is overwhelming is not the moment at which you wanna be redesigning the system. And that in the rhythms of systems change, the one thing that disrupts that is when a new system sort of tips up and just overtakes the old system in, in mid-flight. And here an easy example is voice over IP taking over long distance phone calls, right? The phone companies didn't know that was gonna happen. They thought they were gonna sell fat bits and have a great uh, sort of monopoly on communications and then the internet eats them and eats them without provoking a world crisis and changes the way and the costs and the nature of our ability to communicate. That, that, was, a, that was a gigantic shift of a very locked in bureaucracy. Go to the ITU, go, go look at any national phone company and how much each government depended on the national phone company to make exorbitant profits, to, to pass off as bribes to their, you know, uh, to their brothers and cronies. Um, and then look at what's happened since and, and the desperate attempt and in some cases successful attempt to tamp down on the internet to stop internal dissent and all of that. So that, that's a change that's happened in our lifetimes very visibly um, of the scale that we're talking about. So uh, uh, Matt, you don't think so? No, I think, I think the scale of that change is, um, is you know- Much smaller? Uh, a pimple on the butt of what we're talking about. A colorful I mean, metaphor indeed. I mean, I, I just, you know, the thing that Doug brings up, which I, I really want to honor is that we made choices along the way as a civilization, as humanity that have wired deep, 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 deep into the way that we operate around ownership and 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 so those contracts to break are are they are as systemic as they come and we we like to think you know this idea of um you know let's let's pilot iterate you know test learn scale right you know we go through these things it's we are not dealing with a problem that that can be can be done, can be handled in that way, right? This is not about working on the fringes and then connecting, connecting the dots. It is, it is at the very core of, you know, this is a, this is, this is catharsis at human scale all at the same time where there has to be breakdown. There has to be, it, it's like, you know, coal into diamonds. I mean, it, liqu it liquefies. And it's like, how do we, how do we engineer a moment where society liquefies and then restructures itself quickly enough that we can, can, can leap that abyss? And I think, you know, Doug, maybe the answer is we, we wait. We wait until things start to really burn, until creative destruction takes its course, and then we're ready to rebuild. You know, I, I don't know. I've been wrestling with the same thing that you're wrestling with. It's, 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 um, 
you know, I think I can work the fringes and I think we can. So, so one strategy is wait for creative destruction. The other strategy is you create alternative reality and you invite people to that alternative reality and we run it differently where we run our lives together with other people that want to run their lives together outside of the bounds of, you know, the rest of the world. And then you, and then you move people over into those things. I mean, it's a, it's because part of the challenge right now is we've run out of room for nation building. You know, the democratic experience that came from the United States was because there was land to be taken. There's no more land to be taken. There's no more. And this is why Elon Musk wants to move to Mars. You know, he thinks Mars is the opportunity to reinvent humanity, not just to live, but, but a whole new society. Now, the fear is that we poured over again, industrial mindsets into that thing. I mean, we are talking about the mental model of all mental models that has to change simultaneously. And that's scary. I don't know. Um, so take, I hope you take this in the right spirit. You're sounding a lot like Steve Bannon, who is an accelerationist, who is like, hey, let's break the system because I want to I want to be the king who des who designs the next system when we've crushed and destroyed all of this. And and yeah. one of and one of my narratives for for Donald Trump, why Donald Trump was elected in the first place, was that I think a lot of his followers were like, the system is so screwed in a way that we would generally agree with that we need to hire a guy who's just going to come in with a wrecking ball. And he tried pretty hard. And, and, and no, they, they, were... they, hired a, they hired a guy that was basically an industrialist. I mean, so they weren't, they weren't hiring someone to break it down. They were hiring somebody, you know, to capitalize on their fear and their, you know, oh. so he really was, I mean, if you talk to my mom, he is, he is a model of her father's generation, not a model of the future generation. So he, he's not a tear it down in the way that, you know, people think. He's a tear it down in, in a different type of... Well, I don't know that it's absolutely either way. I'd love to see a poll. If anybody knows of a poll that has sort of the segments of Trump followers between uh, world's best businessmen, you know, uh, apprentice, uh, apprentice branded world's best businessman versus this dude could actually break the system enough that we could get into a new system. I'd love to know that spectrum. Mark, do you have some info on that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I have I have enough um, Republican friends um, that is that is you know kind of evenly split, um, but but definitely the lower you go um, on on the social stratus, um, there you'll find people who really are upset with the system. They feel let down, um, and and that's and that's enough to get a guy elected. Or oh, that was enough to get a guy elected. And I, I just wanted to jump yeah, in. Too, so. Yeah. So. Well, just... of it is what should. What... Oh, sorry. Right, go ahead. Julian's got a bolt. I was going to try to get him before we had to wrap, and I have to head to a new call soon, but let's finish this part of the conversation. Go ahead, Michael. I was just going to say, from a math point of view, the, the, the polling that does show a balance tipping number of Trump voters who would have supported Bernie. You know, I mean, it, there, there are enough of those to say that these are people who just wanted to blow things up, you know, in the sense that they didn't want the establishment candidate for whatever other reasons they might have had. So remember the flow chart that showed up early in the election cycle, the 20, 2015 election cycle, there was a flow chart that said, is the system fucked up? And then the, the yes branch had Trump and Bernie, the no branch had everybody else. Right, and, and, and everybody else was busy sort of, and, and, and I realized a week after Hillary lost that I had voted for a, a steward of the status quo. Like I realized that she was gonna be really good for the status quo and that that was a reason why so many people had voted against her among many others, like the demonization of the Clintons and all that. But, but and I don't think there's a blanket explanation, but I'm, I'm interested in how big each of those segments is because what you do when you're building a weird coalition like this is you gather up all those segments and you appeal to all of them. So if you look back on the Apprentice series as branding, it's just genius. If you're going to run for president as the, the world's greatest, smartest billionaire businessman, you run a, a, a reality show for a decade that gets great ratings. And man, you've convinced a whole tier of, of the American economy and voters that you're the world's best businessman. They, and they, they believe it. 
And that's different from tearing the system apart, but not incompatible with tearing the system apart in a weird, in a strange kind of way. And, yeah, the, guy, and the guy who lives in a gold room with a gold toilet being somehow representative of the farmer out in the middle of the field who is nothing like that and, and feeling an alliance, that's, a, that's an act of alchemy and magic in, in my head, but it worked. Go ahead, Matt, and then Mark, and then we'll wrap the call. We move from Doug and Matt's check-in into Trump somehow. Can we yes. let go of that narrative for a while? I'm trying to cleanse him out of my system here. Okay, good point. We've, we've headed there. Uh, shall we wrap the I just, Trump analysis? I just, yeah, I, ju I just want to say that that the, what, however we look at the situation, the framing is essential. The framing explains so much of. So when we say oh, you know, there is a bunch of people who want to blow things up. It doesn't help. It just, it's just not true. Um, so you have Isn't to- Isn't that part of framing? Well, we, we well, can have this yeah. conversation separately. Yeah, yeah, but, but I, mean, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's the same. I, I live the same in the Amazon, right? Um, and and it's, sometimes you, you have to work and redefine how people see the problem to have a chance to fix it. Totally agree. Um, does anyone want to offer something that'll cleanse our cleanse yes, our minds? I do. Yes. Ken, Thank please. And, and I'm sorry Doug left because he, he said two things. He said there's poetry in that, and he said that's the way it is. And so that made me grab this book called That's the Way It Is, uh, or The Way It Is, which is new and selected poems by my favorite poet, William Stafford. And um, so the poem, The Way It Is, is very short. I think it, it will wrap up here. Um, there's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it's hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, you suffer and get old. Nothing you can do to stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. Um, thank you, Ken. And that, I had that poem in my brain. I just added the link to it in my brain, partly only because um, above it, you'll see a link called Poems for Rex, which is connected to another one called Poems Read in Rex. And if you'd like to have a collection of interesting poems to, to ponder or to read in front of groups, because I used to start every Rex meeting with a poem, which made me read a lot more poetry. And Stafford is great. So thank you for that. And, and sorry to jump in with that so quickly after you read the poem, uh, but I think a bunch of us, including me, have to jump to different calls. Um, but thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a great week. And there you have it. Here we are. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we'll, get, we'll get time like, um, Thanks for your contact. I'll have my I'll have my assistant reach out and all that stuff. But I do feel like we're on we are circling around similar you know similar things. Yeah, and and I also um, in, in that in that circling, I'm I'm really I've I've put you know my my life savings into factor, um, and um, you know I want it to. To be something and I'm not you know to I think it, it was you who was saying to you know Vincent you know are you in this for the jackpot um and that's not what you said but you know or yeah. are, are you in this because you really want this thing to exist and that's primary and you know everybody's somewhere on that spectrum um I'm a lot more on the you know I really want this to exist and, and be a model for other things place so I'm looking to involve other people and, and uh, yeah. find ways. Are you guys, are you guys at, um, I mean, maybe even, um, I'm, I'm actually curating something right now um, for a big, big client. We're calling it, um, we, we did this event. It was modeled off of, you know, kind of a TED, it was a TED style event and we called it comfy chair, right? People, I, created, a, I took over the ballrooms and instead of doing the normal chairs, we put big living room furniture and um, and so they called it, they called it comfy chair and we put content on the stage. And then 
And then over time, it sort of, you know, kind of lost its moment, which was fine. And we're rebooting it in the virtual world. But this time I said, well, let's not do sort of an event. Let's do a, more of it. Let's have it be more like a festival, a virtual festival week, right? You know, you have multiple things going on in multiple places and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so we're calling it Couchella. Um, it's sort of a <laughs> nod to yeah. nod back to the coffee chair. I didn't do the branding on either one of these, but um, I, I'm going I'm going with it. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we're really interested in is this idea of developing a hub for you know for the content to live after the fact, where where people can look at what's been produced, but then start to comment and add their own knowledge into it. And, you know, um, we have a very simple um, what, um, kind of um, multi-directional slipstream where you can, you can scroll down, you know, just flip through it just like a normal slipstream. But then when you get to a piece of content, you can actually flip the other way where you, you flow through the content that's been curated against or stimulated from that content, right? Um, and I don't know, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see. It's almost like a Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory kind of elevator kind of thing. That being said, if factor is, is kind of an interesting place, I might have an inter, you know, an enterprise client that we could, you know, we could get, we could start the conversation. Now, the problem is, is they're, they're a year, they're a year process to get any kind of enterprise license because they go through all the security due to blah, 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 right? Yeah. But, um, maybe a little bit of a demo of what you're building um, and understanding that. I also think my digital practice, um, we, we build front end little microsites for people is, is in, in our, you know, to help one of our change engagements. We're not building a lot of back end, but I've been having conversations with, I just hired someone to run that group at the beginning of the year, but I'm starting to talk to them about some of these OGME type ideas. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're maybe you're a couple of clicks ahead, and we just we just start to think about it, right? Together, um, yeah. you know. I don't have a desire to to own everything and build everything, but I I I think sometimes these partnership models are so hard because of the alignment and the control or the or the overhead becomes difficult to manage when you start to get a bundle of different organizations and go to market together, right? Yeah. Um, you're, you're, you're basically over, the client overpays for everything. Um, and then your value proposition just breaks down. So I, I just think that there's, you know, some conversations to be had. Um, sure. Thoughts? Yeah, that sounds, I mean, I'm, I'm all about conversations <laughs> and, uh, and what you're saying I, I want to familiarize myself a little bit. I mean, I've looked at your your site. Um, I have a you know general idea of of uh, what you do and the breadth of what you do, which looks really cool. Yeah. Uh, and um, you know, my one of the things that I'm frustrated by is like my background is in. Uh, I may not be the best verbally, but. Mm. I'm really good at helping people. You know, I, I started off as a magazine creative director okay. and, and then editor and, you know, figuring out what it is people are trying to communicate, packaging it, putting the signage on it, um, editing it, billing it. And, and now, you know, for me, what I feel like I'm wanting to do with Factor is, is give everybody the tools to do all of that so they can find what they want to find, present what they want to present, um, you know, cross pollinate and curate. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, there are, there's a, there's a lot of overlap in, in yeah. some of what we're doing and, and what I like to do. Well, so it's interesting. So we, we are, we're change facilitators, right? Mm -hmm. We design creative interventions or new systems and we install them and you know we either conduct them into the system of the organizations we work with or we build out the infrastructure and those sorts of things so we're we're really we're really trying to get in orbit with our clients and then look at these opportunities to say okay how how might we help them unlock something think about something move forward in a reasonable way and so um it started out as 
you know, strategy workshops. That's what I got trained in designing. Um, and then I took it to my clients. And then I, I was like, well, it's not just the workshop. There's all of these other superpowers that I wish I had. Right. And so as a, I was a sculpture major and I was, did new genre sculpture. People say, well, what, what medium do you work in? You know, what tools do you like to use? And I was like, I'll use whatever it is. You know, I'm kind of a like gather, gather steel shamelessly and then use it for whatever that, that expression was. So that's kind of what I did with Collective Next. We built a creative arm. That's like a, call it an agency, but we only use it for our work. We're not doing like logo design and branding for restaurants, right? We have a productions group, which is made up of people that um, mostly were like NPR journalists and reporters and, you know, kind of thing. And then we have this digital group, which, you know, there are people who know how to do kind of web design and front end kind of stuff. And now I'm interested in fission, which is in, in uh, kind of all these back end kind of op open systems and, you know, things. So, um, and those are, those are our capabilities right? And capabilities are just building blocks that, that our solution designers, who are kind of our consulting arm, will go and configure mm -hmm. for clients to do these strategic interventions. And then we also take those capabilities and we send that, sell them direct to market for anyone else who wants to take them and configure them, right? So we have people who scribe conversations on the wall, you know, do graphic facilitation, and anybody who wants a graphic facilitator can call us and get a graphic facilitator, we're not doing the, we're not designing the intervention. They are, but they're using our capability to do that. So it's kind of, it's kind of a, a dual distribution model, right? Um, and I'm interested in now moving into capabilities, not just being pools of resource, resources, know-how, but actually building block platform kind of componentry, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and what I really want to build is the 21st century operating system, which we can then install in these organizations to help them better sense what's going on in the world, make sense of that, and then make choices based on that, and then align and mobilize their organization around, around those changes. And my belief is, if we create systemic awareness, they will have no choice but to make better decisions, right? Um, so this client is a big financial services company, which I'm doing Coachella. And one of the whole areas that we, we want to focus on is um, emerging economies. We want to introduce them to the fact that they think about the economy being this, but really there's, there's feminist economies and there's decentralized economies and there's the sharing economy and, you know, and sort of open up, open up those conversations. And by putting it into a provocative session, which we say, you know, these are the ideas that you, you're, you're going to re reject out of hand, but be open-minded to them just in case. Mm -hmm. um, I can slip in, you know, Trojan horse, a bunch of content that it's not my choice about how they run their business, but it is, but it is my job to expose. So in some ways, like an editor, I'm curating content. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, my producers are producing you know, um, different sorts of situations. My creative group is organizing that in a way that becomes compelling, right? The di we're building these, you know, hopefully building this microsite slipstream kind of thing. And so um, that's, that's it. I'm an interventionist, um, which is why my answer to Doug's question was, I struggle. I've been working with one client for almost 20 years. They're privately held. Um, I have a direct relationship with the owner of the company. Um, so, you know, she is 100% in control of this and I've moved them, you know, yeah. just a little bit, you know, um, which I hope, but so then I go, how does that scale to, you know, 9 billion people? I mean, I go, geez, it's, and I've been working at this for a long time. And um, so I wonder, you know, what gets these big companies off the dime is when they start seeing, you know, seeing their gravestones and then they go, oh, shit, we have to change or we're going to die. And most of them, by the time they get there, it's only a matter of time. And so then, so then it's just a, it's just a question about glide path 
and you know yeah. divestiture and and then pivoting something into something and then rebuilding something completely new out of that out of that destruction right so yeah. anyway that's right. that's a little bit about us and um where we're at how long has factor been in business how long have you guys been around well we've been an entity for over five years um okay. And uh, I had a co-founder who um, left at the beginning of the pandemic for personal reasons. He, he and his family shot out of here and moved back to Australia, which is where mm. he was from. I had a co-founder that moved back to Australia for personal okay. reasons. I had a co-founder that moved back to Australia for personal reasons. Really? Funny. Uh, and uh, so, so since then, there's been a, you know, both between COVID and the realizations it brought and, uh, and just, you know, the, the slowdown of various things. There's been some refocusing and we're, we're sort of at a, a flex point. So I, I almost feel like we're a new business rather than a five-year-old business, but we've got a, a, a product, you know, that exists and it's, you know, in public beta and we're not really publicizing it right now because of these changes that we want to make, but a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, getting the money behind it that we need, and uh, and that has to do with entity entity clarification and and mm -hmm. how we're working together. Um, what, one thing parenthetically that I was just going to mention is you were talking about um, businesses becoming extinct. The thing I was doing before this, a after I left the you know full time publishing world. I, I worked for Time Inc. as an editor at large, mm -hmm. like 2003 or something like that. And then I was just doing consulting, which I did before, which was mostly talking about digital transformation to mm -hmm. legacy media companies where, you know, I knew people. And it was so heart-wrenching to see these brands that had so much brand equity that, you know, why wasn't I mean, I, I wrote a proposal for, for People, People Magazine, that basically was Facebook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, they owned the brand People. And, yeah. had, and this was like way, way, and this was like late 90s. And, right. and, you know, that whole being able to see what you could be if you took off, if, if you just considered who you are and what your purpose is without like, well, we have, you know, 17 copy editors, what's their job going to be, if right. we, you know, which is something right. you have to consider. But if you start there, you know, that's not, that's not going to leave you open to the possibilities that will stop you from becoming extinct. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I completely agree. And there's a, there's an old axiom that I, that I've been carrying around for many years, which is nothing fails like success, right? The more successful we are, the more entrenched we are in the behaviors that produce that success, which means the more likely that when context changes that we're not capable of changing with it, right? Um, so, I mean, that's, I mean, that's the thing. We, we blind ourselves to these things because we have you know, 10 copy editors that do copy editing that have always done copy editing. And, and that's they, the system itself per will perpetuate all things that relate to copy editing until, you know, until it's destroyed, um, which is different than if you take almost like um, there's a ec economist named Cesar Hidalgo who talks about really about these capability mindsets. And so if you start viewing copy editing as a capability versus a set of tasks then you go well what is copy editing you know what is the job that it's actually doing and how does that job become useful in whatever context right it's the difference between the like this idea of a theme which has a subject and object and ver you know all this stuff and a ream which takes the subject out of it and then that ream becomes the capability only and you can put whatever subject into it, right? That's this, you know, it's context independent so that you can 
then be interoperable with the context as it's evolving. So I know I got a little, um, little philosophical there, but um, um, as you pivot, let's, you know, let's talk. I mean, um, you know, I'm, in, I'm, I'm interested in conversations as well. I'm interested in seeing what's going on. And, um, you know, if, if you want a beta in anywhere, you know, I mean, I can, I'm trying to sell my clients into places where we can beta, right? I'm trying to get them to pay me to build, you know, stuff for the commons, but that they get the perpetual use license to, yeah, to have yeah. it, right? Um, yeah. You know that kind of model. So I, I mean, let's 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 be serious about moving some of this stuff forward. That sounds um, good. Yeah. Cool. Nice, uh, nice connecting. Yeah, yeah. But, Any final yeah. thoughts? Um, just that I'd, I'd really like to continue the conversation. I just feel have, have felt you know a real rapport with you, um, which is you know, getting back to our other other conversation easy because we're, you know, white guys in Brooklyn of a certain age and blah, yeah. blah, right. like, <laughs> blah. Like, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm living in Boston, you're living in Brooklyn and- um, Oh, you're in Boston? Okay, yeah. sorry. So we're, we're both, you know, I grew up in the Midwest though, so I bring some of that, but yeah. Um, I was born in the Midwest, but I grew up on the West Coast, so I don't where, know. Where were, you, where were you born? Cleveland. I mean, it's okay. not really the Midwest. But, you know, well, Midwest. yeah, I mean, it depends. People yeah. in people in Ohio say they're on the East Coast, but you know, they're really part of the the Rust Belt, right? We all yeah. that kind of you know. I was born outside of Milwaukee, so um, okay. there's a lot of the same DNA. And then you lived out in Cali for a while before going. Yeah, to Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mostly grew up in 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 Berkeley, so that's a whole another thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I went to graduate school and lived in San Francisco, so oh, okay. um, yeah, I've I've been to the Berkeley Hills couple of parties there I was definitely a fish out of water so um yeah that's, that's where my mom my mom lives in the you know the base of the Berkeley Hills okay you know, the gourmet ghetto as they used to call it right? <laughs> and East and Pete's coffee and all those things were born. cool very cool um yeah Oakland is um is um seeming to have a kind of an interesting renaissance right now For sure. Definitely the Brooklyn of the Bay Area. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty pretty cool. That's the school I should have gone to then versus the San Francisco Art Institute, but um, it was what CCAC or yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just you know, um, yeah, it was a little bit more. It was a little bit more. I think adventurous. I was in a my program was a great. It was a great program. I went there and I just I couldn't stand it. Um, mm. I couldn't. It was too. I was like, I came from a liberal arts school and when, and even that was just a big shock going from um, liberal arts artist to, to an art school only and the whole art world in the nineties and San Francisco in that time frame was like Facebook before Facebook where everybody wanted to become friends but nobody was friend, would be your friend. Um, mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It was about connecting and then saying, you're my friend. And yeah. um, so moving out East it's maybe more my more my feel um yeah. so cool yeah. um well it's nice connecting i'll have um katia greens her name and i'll have her reach out and we'll uh we'll find some time to you know to keep talking sure sounds good all right take all care right. Bye.